All right, folks, um, we seem to have a full room, so we'll get started. We'll probably get a couple more people try and squeeze in. Uh, in a few minutes. So we're going to, uh, oh, I thought you were talking about test. No? Okay. I'm not talking about that. Testing is important, though. Yeah. So it's a pleasure to interview, uh, interview to introduce <laughs> Taylor, uh, who I've known for a few years. If you've Unless you've been completely asleep for the last few years, you will have read some, several of Temu's papers, starting with his work on PIP and the Host Identity Protocol, and then on uh, data-oriented networking. We read it in CS244 yesterday, the donor paper, which really uh, presaged the, all the interest in information-centric networking, which has obviously been a big topic in the last couple of years. And then, of course, SDN, which is going to be the main topic of Temu's talk today. And in recognition of all of that, he's uh, just uh, received the ACM, the SICOM Rising Star Award at the end of last year. Um, because so much of this work done early in his career, it uh, can be kind of interesting to see what he does next. Because it's going to be a pretty tough act to follow, I think, after all of those things. So it's going to be uh, exciting, to, exciting to see. Okay, without further ado, I have you take it. Well, thanks for the introduction. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, so I thought I would use this opportunity to present some observations and thoughts um, on the network design and especially how SDN is, is about to change some classic assumptions we all have had for quite, quite a few years now. And I, I think not everyone really realizes uh, the implications of these changes I'm going to talk about unless you have really, really careful, carefully been following what's going on in the industry. But, First few comments about my background, just to establish some context for this presentation. So, I do write code, uh, and I stopped designing protocols a long time ago. And I have no first first hand experience uh, about designing hardware. So, so please do keep this in mind. Uh, but having that said, I, I, I do have plenty of experience in, 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 in on, on designing and implementing these systems, and that's pretty much what I've been doing for the past 15 years, actually, of my life. Um, so not given this, this background, you could think that I'm all pro open flow, pro, pro SDN, and I have nothing but great things to say about SDN. But, but after using probably the past five years of my life to actually design, implement, and deploy networks built on open flow and SDN, I have to say that we actually didn't get <coughs> most of the things right in the beginning. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I do, I do believe in certain aspects of SDN even more than, more than before. So I want to begin this presentation uh, with some observations over the past few years, what I've personally learned and kind of stumbled into. And then after this very brief recap of the, the lessons, I thought it would make sense to, to kind of focus on the aspects that I actually see valuable in SDN. And, and so I will be talking about SDN as abstractions, constructions, again based on the implementation and deployment experiences over the, over the past years. And then finally, having these structures uh, and abstractions as my building blocks, I'll, I'll conclude this all by, by extending their scope even further and, and trying to share some, some thoughts about the impl their implications for the networking in general and, and perhaps the, the, uh, the, their implications for the networking community as a whole. So let's begin with the next building blocks. So here's your typical classic open protocol enable network. It looks just perfect, right? I mean, you have this centralized model. It's easy to program all the network. You can do whatever you want to do almost. You, you have this extreme power at your hands. You have these cheap switches you can, you can use. And, 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 and you remain connected to switches all the time uh, over this protocol every single vendor agrees about. So that sounds pretty nice. But as some of you might have kind of witnessed and kind of felt the pain yourself, there's probably something wrong with this picture. And so first, I think this, this, this whole idea of centralization can be very misleading, because it's just the fact that, that reaching any practical levels of, of scaling and availability, you can't have just a single controller, but you have to be prepared for some level of distribution among the controller system. And now, while well, having said this, I'm not obviously implying that you would have to have the same level of distribution you have today in the physical networks where the distributed routing protocols actually spread through all the, all the elements. No, we can actually implement the distribution among the control elements, hopefully in a way that actually simplifies the control problem a bit. But 
we shouldn't assume that the, the distribution goes away. So that was fairly obvious. So what about the, the, the protocol we use to control this, which is that, I mean, OpenFlow sounds practical, it's very powerful protocol, but yet, yet at the same time, it's actually very fine-grained when it comes to managing the switch state. And it's actually this fine-grained aspect that actually complicates the management of switches quite a bit if you're doing it at scale. Let's say you're managing thousands of switches or tens of thousands of switches, you actually have quite a bit of state within the central cluster you're, you're managing. It could be easily tens of gigabytes of, of just flow entries. And, and that's, that's a lot of state for any kind of a system. And obviously it's even worse if you follow the kind of classic Ethan model that you would forward always the first packet uh, all the way up to the controller cluster. This just makes it very complicated to, to the scale. So it's clear that this sort of a very low-level TCAM-like like, like abstraction and this TCAM-like state management, uh, as well as pushing the first packet into the controller cluster, it doesn't mix well with large-scale systems you see in data centers. So clearly there are way more efficient presentations of that same state. You almost like push some policy configuration down uh, to the switches and then let the switches themselves transform these, these policy configuration into flow entries locally. Uh, that's like with the routers. Router, router CPUs, they don't transfer flow entries directly as such down to the line cost, but they actually transfer uh, routing entries down and in the line cost locally transfer the, transfer the, or transform the, the, the entries into, into flow entries that can be fed into the ASICs they have there. So what about the vendor neutrality of the protocol? Well, if any one of you has actually tried to implement something on top of a hardware switch, she knows the pain I'm talking about. Because you basically have to tailor your application, your, your, your pipelines you use to manage your pack or control your packets for every single switch set, or for every single chip set in the switch. And this simple dream, this, 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 this single huge open flow table you would have at every single switch, it's just not there even after five years. And in fact, even today, to utilize all the capabilities and resources you have in the modern chips and switches, you have to be prepared to customize everything in terms of the, the, the hardware pipeline exposed by the vendor. But you obviously know the root cause of it, because vendors do care about the production costs of the chips. I mean, the dive service actually does matter when it comes to the costs. And as obviously, they do care about having unique features from, from the competition point of view. And then finally, this assumption that, that, that the, the, the controllers do remain connected to the switches all the time, it just doesn't hold in practice. Because network partitions do happen, and you have to carefully engineer the whole system in a way that even though <coughs> your switch is disconnected from the controller cluster, you may be still connected on the data plane side, and packets may be flowing, and you have to do the right thing, even though you don't have the exact connection to the, to the controller. So again, it's, it's again that, that simple as the original simple classic open flow model made it sound true. So all in all, so you would think that I have basically lost <coughs> my faith in SDN and open flow after five right years, because I, I, this is a fairly skeptical viewpoint I make. Um, but and I just trashed basically all the central kind of components of the classic SD and open flow design. Uh, I said the centralization, centralization is not there. Uh, the open flow as an abstraction is way to a low level. Uh, network partitioning makes things more complicated in practice, and it just doesn't seem like the right thing. But it's actually exactly the opposite. <coughs> I think all these issues I mentioned, they have only clarified to me what's really essential and foundational in SDN, and why it's actually still, has always been, on its way to change the way we do network. And what makes me say so? I think the really the most important lesson of SDN relates to this separation of control and data plane. And it's, it's easy to say that, but what, what I actually mean by that. So we know why internet is so robust. It's this extreme level of distribution of functionality over all the network elements that makes every single network element being able to operate individually without any help from the rest of the network. And it's really beautiful from a robustness point of view. It's actually really difficult to do any better than that. But unfortunately, we do know what it means from the, from the control plane point of view. Because now the control plan becomes totally distributed. There's no single central API of any kind in the system where you would be able to configure the whole, whole network. <clears throat> so you only have indirect means to control the network by, by fine-tuning the knobs and, 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 and settings of individual <coughs> network elements. And 
the same problem actually exists on the some extent on the data plane side, the data plane side as well. So spreading all these apples, all these complicated policies all over the network elements doesn't exactly simplify the system. Exactly the opposite, actually. And this is just because we have been enslaved with this sort of an extreme model of distribution that we have to distribute all the functionality over all the network elements. <coughs> and, and getting rid of this thinking is, I think, the very value of STN. Because STN was the first one to first to actually articulate that that we should design, we should not design the control, network control, in terms of the physical topology. Instead, we should decouple the control plane from the physical topology, not to a single server, but to a cluster of controllers, and, and then, then design the control plane distribution in terms of the, the, the requirements for the control, scalability, and availability of the, of the problem we are, we, are, we are solving. And we can do that by following generic principles of distributed systems, instead of being confined in this small corner of the science space used by all the routing protocols. And then if you do that, then you can really open your mind and start thinking the overall structure of the network, not the, just the control plane, but the whole network. And then how you could make the network more simple, how you could make it more flexible, how you could make it more modular, all those properties we have been lacking for the networks. And I think it's exactly this change, from the, uh, change of the priorities from the data plane towards the control plane and, and its requirements, the simplicity and the modularity and flexibility that I see the most valuable aspect of SDN. So now that we have actually freed ourselves from, from the sort of a physical topology and this extreme distribution, uh, let's consider how we could kind of start re redesigning the networks uh, with this mindset in, in, in our heads. So where are we today? Just some random post that you obviously know what I'm going to kind of say here. Basically, that we just have this huge collection of, of, of protocols today, and it's like it's the mess. I mean, it's, it's not a well-defined science of any kind. If you show this to any anyone, say, I don't know, programming languages, operating systems, file systems, databases, communities, those folks at least have some sort of a principles and foundations. We have nothing. We just have this sort of pile of protocols after 30 years. So, how did we get here? It was actually fairly easy. <laughs> Because we just get implementing new data plane mechanisms and solving data plane problems one after one. And that's, that's fine as such. But whenever we did so, what happened was that we kept adding new mechanisms on the control plane side of, on top of the older mechanisms. And, and when we were done with the one problem, we moved on to the next one. And what happened was obviously over the time we were piling up more and more control plane mechanisms and eventually we had a fairly impressive collection of protocols and, and, and control plane mechanisms. And as you know, there is this resulting mix of control and plane protocols. It's not simple to reason about. But on the data plane side, at least, we have some basic layering. And, and, and it kind of makes sense, because the focal point was always on the data plane side and on the physical topology. So the kind of focus was there first, and it was always the control plane that had to adapt to this, this, this problem solving on the data plane side. So, even that we have this sort of a mess with the control plane protocols. So let's think about what's really the, what are the kind of fundamental causes for that. So it's, it's always so easy to say that we have a problem, it's, it's a mess, we should fix that. But what, what are we really missing in terms of, of, of solving, solving this mess we have? I think that pretty much everything actually relates to or revolves around the concept of modularity. Uh, so for instance, we don't have too many concrete very good, very explicit uh, examples of separations of concerns, uh, meaning problems of one particular problem, one particular, one, one, one specific protocol, then spill over from, from, from that protocol to other protocol, and, and then it's like, like nothing, is, nothing is contained, and, 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 and everything becomes tangled <coughs> because the implementations, the protocols, they, they, they will introduce dependencies between themselves, and, and you don't have this nice property that one problem would be solved at one location, one within, within one component, and the rest of the system wouldn't have to care about care about any aspects of, of, of that problem. So the overall system becomes more and more complicated because we have more and more dependencies because of, of, of this lacking separation of concerns. And then I think that the the the, the very principle of, of abstraction is also somewhat lacking. Uh, and it's a bit different from the separation of concerns in the sense that, that uh, every single developer who has done 
any sort of like object-oriented coding knows that you should hide the internals of your object or your class from the users of the class. And, and why you do that? Because you want to prevent anyone from creating dependencies into the internals of your implementation so that later you can actually just replace the implementation without anyone knowing that you replaced the implementation with something that's improved. Uh, some, some, somehow, we somehow improved the uh, implementation. <coughs> and so, but the key here is that you need to have an abstraction, you need to have an interface for this module so that, that the users of this module don't create any additional, any harmful dependencies to the implementation of this module. And this is very obvious in programming, but we don't follow this principle really that well when it comes to networking. So no one said that this would be easy. I mean, I mean, you, you could make the statement that, that networking is a young field of, 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 of computer science, and, and first we had to make our systems functional first, and 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 we didn't have the time to make them pretty. So, to say. but I, I think it's exactly thanks to SDN that 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 we should now sit down and actively think about these problems. And the reason why I'm saying actively, because it's so trivial to miss these sort of structures and abstractions I'm, I'm, I'm referring to. Uh, because you have to be explicitly looking for these principles and, and, and these ideas and these, these, these concepts. And, and again, the analogy to the programming would be that everyone who has done any sort of a programming knows that if you're trying to improve the modularity of any sort of a major, major application, that takes active effort. Even keeping the module at the same level requires active effort. But if you're going to improve it, it requires way more, way more effort. But if you don't do anything, it's currently that the, 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 the modularity level goes down, you will have more and more dependencies within your system. So next I'm going to go over some, net, some structures and abstractions I've stumbled into over the past five years. And I think they could have some, some interesting long-lasting implications in terms of simplifying the general network design. Uh, and they're exactly building on these two principles I mentioned. Separation of concerns and, and, and using abstractions to hide details and, and to reduce dependencies. So the first structure is called fabric. And with fabric, I, I, I basically refer to a, a, a similar provider of connectivity you have within the routers and switch sheets, meaning you have, you have the backplane that provides full bisectional bandwidth between any, any endpoint attached to the, to the backplane. And this time, the only difference is just that uh, we're doing it over the network instead of doing it within the, within the chassis. So let's think about MPLS network. In MPLS network, you have the edge routers that are, are the only ones that are forwarding based on the IP addresses. And in some sense, that's where all the semantically interesting stuff happens. Because in the middle of the network, <coughs> You have only these simple switches that just lay forward, forward packets based on these MPLS labels. So there's this very clear divide between the core and edge. There's this very clear separation of concerns in this sort of a design. And now let's contra contrast this to the this MPLS network uh, to a modern computing environment which has been virtualized, meaning all the workloads actually run uh, on VMs, which run on, on, on top of hypervisors. And obviously in this sort of a network, the VMs might belong to different tenants. Uh, and every tenant probably would like to have their own network and uh, not exposing any of the traffic they have to any other tenant. So how people do it, uh, how, how people solve this sort of problem today in the data center is that they actually build tunnels, uh, layer, two layer three tunnels over the, over the, over the network core and, and the tunnels contain enough information so that the receiving hypervisor knows to which VM, VM this, this package <coughs> belongs to. But the point being that this sort of a setting actually becomes very similar to MPLS in, in, in some sense. Because it's again the edge that is basically doing all the, all the semantically interesting processing for the packets because the middle of the network is doing nothing but forwarding these encapsulated packets quickly, cheaply uh, uh, over, the, over the network. And it's this internal part of the network that is doing nothing but forwarding packets, these tunnel packets that we call fabric. And in some sense this fabric is just kind of like one huge switch all these hypervisors used just to send quickly packets over the net. But the point here is that neither the fabric cares about the packets that are sent over. It doesn't care what's within the encapsulation. It actually doesn't care about the encapsulation format that much. Uh, and the same way, hypervisors don't, and they're definitely not the VMs, they don't care about the internals of the factory. So 
this should sound fairly similar to kind of a backbone design of, of a modern distributed chassis at this point. We just do it over the network instead of doing it within the chassis. So what's the reason why, why <coughs> within this sort of environment, uh, you, you, you actually take this sort of an approach? Because clearly, you could, you could just pick a different sort of a design and say, oh, it's more of a classic design, and say that let's implement the isolation and all the features you need to provide for the VMs throughout the network, say by using VLANs and ACOs within the physical networks. Well, I actually claim that all the benefits and reasons why people do it do relate to the separation of concerns. Because in this sort of fabric model, it's exactly the network edge that implements the network policy, and fabric is just doing the the, 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 the yeah. delivery. And it's this separation that allows the both of the solutions actually become simpler. Fabric can just focus on delivering packets. It doesn't need to understand anything about policies. You don't need to have ACOs, anything implemented in these switches. Or you don't even have to support the ACOs within the chipsets you use within the within the fabric switches. And on the edge, you can more fo you can focus on the flexibility than providing interesting network policies and features, but be less obsessed about the speed. And more importantly, you can actually evolve these both independently. You can replace the fabric without without changing the hypervisor at all. And in the same way, you can upgrade the, the, the features you provide at the edge of the network without changing the fabric at all. And this is obviously very convenient if the vendors happen to be different uh, for the fabric and the edge. So, <clears throat> so to state it very exp explicitly, um, where I'm kind of heading to, 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 to the, with this, 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 this clear divide between the, the edge and the, and the core. So, Edge was all about the flexibility of operations, speed less, whereas fabric was more about providing reliable, quick, cheap transport. And as, as you can kind of predict, the, 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 the platforms, the hardware platforms you, you use to provide the function within this sort of a network, they are very different. X86, all about flexibility. <laughs> Fairly okay in terms of packet forwarding, but not that great. Whereas ASICs, very rigid, very difficult to add new features, but extremely fast, extremely, they provide extremely high aggregate uh, bandwidth <coughs> if, if necessary. <coughs> so fabric was the first structure. So let's look at another structure I've stumbled into, and which is even more useful in terms of like, more useful in terms of establishing moderate modularity and, 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 and increasing simplicity uh, to the network. So do you think about the networks, how do we configure the space? It's, it's pretty ugly actually. Um, the network policy configuration stand, as discussed earlier, it tends to span over all the elements you have in the network. So, just think about a simple policy of A not being allowed to talk to B. In which element would you kind of enforce this policy? And, and what you would do if either one of them actually changes, changes the attachment point uh, within the network? So, once you are asked, why do, should admins, network admins even care about this sort of low-level details? Uh, it wouldn't be much simpler if they would be provided with this sort of a virtual switch and they would just operate with that and they would declare the policies A can talk with B and, and then some magic below would take care of propagating all the policies and configuring the policies properly within the, within the network below. And it turns out that this sort of detail hiding is exactly what network virtualization is about. Instead of exposing the details of physical networks for the users as such, we let the users operate with a topology of virtual switches and routers. So, and obviously, it's not one-to-one -one mapping. You can have multiple virtual switches and multiple virtual routers implemented by a single physical switch, and it's not even like one-to-one -one mapping in the sense that virtual switch could be implemented over, over multiple physical switches. But what's essential here is that, that Users are provided with a topology that has nothing to do with the physical topology. The topology users are provided with is exactly that complicated as they need to express their policies. So in, in some simple cases, a single, single virtual switch, a single logical switch could be completely enough to express all the policies that they might have in, within the data center. But you could have more complicated, more, more demanding customers, more demanding tenants, that actually would prefer to have a bit more complicated topologies. And then you might have them, some extremely demanding customers that have policies that are uh, topologies, logical topologies that are even more complicated than the 
the, the, the physical topology below. But the point is that it's only as complicated as the user's need, tenant's need. And that, that topology remains stable regardless of what happens below in the physical topology. So not only we can actually use the, the virtualization, network virtualization to hide details of the physical layer from the, from the users, but we can actually use recursively multiple times. And in that manner, we could actually make network control scale wider and wider areas of, 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 of the planet almost, in some sense. Um, because we can, we, can, we can hide lower level details from the higher levels of the system to the extent that, that it can scale. Because at the highest level, you have policies that you care about at some global scale. And then at the level below, you have more, more fine grain policies, but they are still not at the lowest level where you care about all the little details. So this is just kind of a basic simple of basic basic following the basic principle of networking that you have to aggregate in order to order to scale. And, and virtual switches actually, if you use virtual switches in this manner, they actually provide this is, this is a fairly subtle point, but they provide a nice interface in terms of the policies because the virtual switches below actually can internally implement and follow whatever policies they have in terms of the traffic management. And and they don't have to follow, they don't have to listen to the, 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 the higher levels at all in terms of what, whatever policies they might have. As long as they provide this sort of virtual switch interface, they can internally use whatever traffic management policies they, they, they might prefer. So it's kind of a clean interface in terms of two different policies, kind of, kind of uh, almost like touching each other uh, within the network. So how do you identify this sort of, this sort of a hierarchical virtual switch structure? Well, it turns out that it's just following the very basic principles of networking. First, you establish the lowest level of, of, of <coughs> virtual switches are probably uh, the smallest area of full connectivity in some sense. For instance, a site could be a, a single virtual switch, whereas the second level could be, say, a metropolitan area, then building on top of these site-specific uh, virtual switches. Uh, then you probably have to also consider the, the Bailey domains, meaning that the smallest Bailey domain you have is probably a single virtual switch, and then the bigger Bailey domain building on top of those Bailey domains, again, would be something you build on top of these low level switches. So for instance, the metropolitan area would be built on top of the, the site specific uh, uh, or building specific uh, uh, virtual switches you have. And then uh, the, the last point that <coughs> if you have this sort of a need to mm, separate policies at different levels, the virtual switch interface is kind of a very good candidate uh, to do that. So back to the implementation of the virtualization. So nothing says that we have to actually use the, the physical, any, any physical switches in the middle of the network to provide the, 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 the network virtualization for the, for the users of the network. Instead, what we can do is we can just combine the ideas of the fabric and the network virtualization, and just make the middle of the, the, the core of the network the fabric that just relates the packets from one edge of the network to the other edge, and the, the edges are the ones that provide all the, all the semantics for the user, and in this case, they would be the ones that provide the, the user with this sort of abstractions, these logical topologies uh, to connect their, their VMs to. <coughs> and we don't have to stop the switches and routers, what we can do is that we can have virtual services as well provided for the users. And again, we don't have to touch the middle parts of the network. We can start to implement everything at the hypervisors or whatever x86 servers you might be using at the edge. And, and, and the middle part of the network remains, remains still simple, even though the users are provided with, with all the services they used to have in the, in the physical networks. So what do we have so far? We have the fabric simplifies the hardware in the middle of the network. And the edges are the one that provide all the semantics in some sense for the user. And obviously in the hypervisor-based environments, it's the hypervisors that provide this edge using the x86. And it's all software. It's extremely flexible. It's future-proof because of the very nature of the software. And then we have this mechanism of network virtualization that we can actually finally, first time in network in some sense, to simplify the topologies uh, the control planes have to manage. Because we can expose for the higher levels of control plane, all these logical controls, 
uh, or they can expose users only with topologies as complicated as they need for their workloads and for their, for their security policies. So we don't have to expose the users all the time with exactly the same physical topology that may be very complicated and uh, has have a lot of details that are completely irrelevant for the users. And the virtualization can be implemented completely at the edge. So now we're getting the interesting part. So how does, how does this all change the define the role of the software and hardware in the network? So a long time ago, probably way before any of any of us, us actually used networks. Uh, this is how, how network elements were built. It was all general purpose CPUs, both doing the control, both, both implementing and providing the control plane, as well as doing the packet forward. That's all we had. And then obviously, as we know, networks became more popular. <coughs> traffic, traffic volumes started to increase, and we had more and more packets to forward. And then at that point, we realized that we have to do something special with the data plane, and that we, we got totally crazy with, with optimizing the data plane using ASICs and TCAMs and all that, that, that crazy stuff. But that was the history. And now I claim that we are moving to the third phase. Software is again taking hold of part of the data plane, but it's not doing it uh, for the whole, whole data plane, just for the edge. <coughs> and, and why we can do it? Obviously, x86 is becoming faster and faster, but it's also because of the fact that, that in case of hypervisor environments, the forwarding you have to do, the software forwarding you have to do, you have to do it only for the VMs you have locally. You're not trying to replace some high, high, high aggregated, highly aggregated switches within the network with x86. Not at all. But it also means that because x86 is now providing more functionally at the edge of the network, the rest of the hardware actually can get more simple. So this gets us to this very clear divide of roles, becoming fairly obvious, at least in data center networks, that software provides all the semantics, all the policies, all the interesting stuff at the edge, and hardware is just providing the high, <coughs> high bandwidth for forwarding packets. And in some sense, this is a perfect marriage. I mean, hardware is doing exactly what is, is so, so great about, and software is doing what is great, great in it. Software is adapting, adapting to, the, to the user requirements that evolve quickly. And, 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 and I've seen, for instance, software vendors for the data paths to release new releases or new, new features for the software data path every month. You can't think of a hardware vendor that would be able to do that with the ASICs. But that's, 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 that's correct. That in some sense, this is a modern version of the end-to-end -end principle. Because what we are doing is we are removing something from the network, from the middle of the network. Doesn't, that doesn't have to be. You just move the function to the edge if it's enough uh, for the overall system. And obviously, at this point, quite a few people in the audience are still thinking that software no, all, 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 never works. It never has worked, and it never will work. Uh, but just to repeat, it's different. We are not trying to replace any high aggregate, highly aggregated, high finite elements here with x86. They are still there, but, but the key thing is actually they will stay. They will be there, and they can they can become even more simple now because they don't have to worry about the, the providing the semantics for the users. And as I said, the software software forwarding is more like a tax for the hypervisors. You're using just a small fraction of your CPU resources to forward packets for your local VMs, that's all. So this has some fundamental implications. Uh, in, in some sense, the priority is actually to get the kind of turned upside down. Because today, how the, how the kind of overall design process works for the kind of classic network hardware and software or elements is that, that the data plane, the ASICs, the, the cost of the die service kind of drives the overall design completely. And it's always the control plane that has to adapt to these restrictions you have on the on the hardware side. So whatever little resources, little tiny resources your hardware is able to provide, you have to somehow work around those limitations. And the, just the practical implication is that the overall system becomes more complicated because the control plane has to take the pain and implement some complicated protocols to kind of deal with these tiny labels you have, for instance, for instance, in the packets because ASICs and the TCAMs are expensive and they can't, can't match all the longer labels, for instance. Whereas if you 
use software <coughs> at the edge to provide all the network semantics, it actually is completely the opposite. You can start from designing the network control and the requirements you have for the users and, and the overall management. And then you can rely on the fact that because you have software forwarding below, it can adapt, it can provide you all the, all the features you might need to realize the network control uh, measures you are implementing using the control plane. And the nice part here is that it actually results in, 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 in simpler system in overall. In the, in the older model, what happened was that, yes, the ASIC was simple, but the whole system was more complicated. In this case, the whole system is more simple, and the software might be involved, but it's a local problem. It's not a global distributed problem that you have there. So that was the divide between the hardware and software and how it's changing. So, but I think this actually has so even some larger, larger implications for the networks as a whole uh, and how we understand the reason about the networks. So, so if you look at the networks today, I mean, it's basically a collection of different control plans as I mentioned earlier. And it's a fairly impressive collection. At the subnet level, you have all the, all the Ethernet protocols, all the spanning tree protocols and the variancy for them. And then you have well, some, some, some wholesale replacements for those protocols as well. And then, then obviously on top of that you, you start building the intradomain routing protocols. And, and, and not only you have quite a few of them, but they also have to be designed and implemented in a way that they interact properly with the, later, with the protocols below. And even if you would be using some similar algorithms perhaps uh, at, at, you, at the both of the, these layers, probably you will have your own implementation for every single protocol, just in case. And then again, once the scope of the network gets wider and wider, you have more and more protocols obviously interacting with the, with the lower level protocols. And then finally, obviously, we have to interface with PGP. And uh, in overall, this whole stack, as discussed, becomes very complicated to reason about. It's just a random collection of protocols in some sense that we have gathered over the time. So why is this relevant then? Well. If I use these structures I just discussed earlier, I can actually construct exactly the same sort of a hierarchy with roughly similar properties, just by using the same principle multiple times, the same abstractions multiple times. And while doing that, I probably would save quite a bit of code as well, because I wouldn't have to have a custom implementation for every single layer. And not it, the point is that I might have I removed the protocol specifics and these different implementations. But uh, this also could make the overall system, system much more simple to reason about uh, because it's not anymore just some sort of a random collection of different techniques, but it's built on the same, same principles applied multiple times. And obviously I'm not, I'm not arguing for the replacement of PGP here, it's PGP is just replaced for the sake of example here. So my point is not that much that that would be exactly the approach to use. Uh, to implement this type of hierarchical global scale control plan with SDN. But my point is that there is an alternative to the current approach of using traditional distributed protocols. And this alternative doesn't require us to use any protocols. And we don't have to approach the problem from a protocol point of view. But we can actually approach this problem from more of a systems, distributed systems point of view. And it's all about using just some well established principles instead of coming up with these specifics for every single instance of roughly the same problem. So, networking community tends to think that networks are somehow very unique uh, from the rest of the systems. But as we know, if you have written any sort of code with Knox uh, or any, any control, SDN controller platform, you actually don't need to know that much about any of the protocols. And I claim that Larger networks are not an exception. They're just distributed systems, and you have to apply standard principles of, of, of considering failure domains, locality, and, and perhaps a bit uniquely in terms of networks, you have to consider also the policies. But designing this sort of a network, or this sort of a wide area, huge, almost global network control system, doesn't have to result in this sort of a mess of protocols we have today. That also implies that, that if we take away all these protocols, we as a community have for networks, quite a bit of the magic we kind of have the secret sauce just disappears. Um, 
and in some sense, protocols are not anymore the kind of an asset we, we kind of carefully maintain and see the value of us, the, the value value providers for us. But if we do that, I claim that actually from the science point of view, we are then making huge progress because we are applying, this implies that perhaps actually in the end, in the networking, you have some well-defined principles and constructions or constructs and structures that you can apply in principled manner without relying on this sort of a Mixed, uh, mixture of, of, of protocols we have today, and which we, by the way, teach to all, all the students still, I think. Um, so, time to summarize. Um, so as discussed, I think the real value of SDN is actually the opportunity for, opportunity to consider or reconsider the structure and design of, of the networks. And Fabric and the network virtualization I gave as an example, they're not just some paper designs, they're actually on their way becoming almost the default when, when this stuff, this sort of stuff is deployed in the, in, 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 the, in, the, in the industry. And these structures, actually I think they, they, they kind of, kind of, they're kind of on their way to cause this divide between the software and hardware to be changing once again in the history of the networking. And it's obviously the virtualized, virtualized environments that are driving this change. And as you know, more and more workloads are becoming virtualized. Um, and, and in the same way, these two protocols are becoming less and less relevant in practical deployments. And surprise, surprise, it's not network protocol developers that actually write and develop these systems. It's all standard systems, distributed systems developers that, that, that implement these, these products and, and maintain these products. And in my opinion, that's exactly what the software part of the SDN stand for, stands for. It's about implementing both forwarding and the control plane in a way that you're free from the kind of classic way of building networks that, that, build, that, 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 that have all the constraints of the hardware, that have all the constraints of the distributed protocols. Instead, networks actually could become the standard systems that you use the standard software development practices and principles. Uh, uh, to make the system simple, modular, and uh, very flexible uh, to develop further. And that's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, yes. Sure. So when you were um, <coughs> talking about the, the fabric and the edge separation over there, what in your mind is the boundary between fabric and edge in some of these kinds of uh, networks like uh, residential access edge, wireless edge, cable edge, there is an edge where there's a heavy, uh, like, you know, there's a lot of flexibility needed and all those things, but it also tends to be an aggregation point. Sure. In your view, is that still the fabric or is that, where does the fabric I had the kind of ideal design here because I was considered just the data of the networks. But I, I think you can kind of apply the same idea uh, and, and in case of like res residential, perhaps it's the first home, uh, not at the home, but say at the provider. So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of, I don't think it needs to be kind of a strict boundary, but there's not like a strict rule where you should have the, the first home, so to say, or where the edge should be. It really depends on the kind of environment you have. So for instance, what you would have is that, that uh, the network virtualization solution we are building for instance, we can integrate remote enterprise sites, yeah. and in some sense, we are just placing the edge to the remote site. They have all the networks, all the existing legacy networks there at the site, but we provide an appliance that integrates their physical networks to the network virtualization solution, and then the edge is actually that device. Yeah. So you still have the physical network. Yeah, and that makes sense. It's just that it tends to be that there's also a heavy amount of aggregation happening sure. at that point. Sure. So sure. when you were saying that edge doesn't need to be aggregation, I just felt that it has to do, it does make sense that you know you push that edge sure. all the way up to that first hop, and, but there's also a heavy aggregation. Sure, sure. But you would also argue that you would be able to build this sort of aggregate networks that provide you that connectivity in a very simple manner that are just kind of channels towards this sort of a device that provides you that, that boundary. Yeah. Meaning, meaning, meaning you have to have, I'm not playing that x86 should be the one that provides you that functionality, but you would design like high aggregated connections towards an appliance that provides you the processing capacity without having the high number of connections actually terminating with that element. Okay. The, the, the distinction might be repeated in the hierarchy that you've 
Sure, sure, sure. Definitely. But, but isn't that what you, what you were saying? Because, I mean, that, that's, that edge point is still software, and the software has to run on a platform, and you said that the platform is x86. Yet, as Imesh just pointed out, that, that position, that point in the network is a high aggregation point, mm -hmm. so it means vast amounts of computation. So how do you reconcile those two things? I'm just saying that, that you don't have to have a huge number of cables being terminated into the appliance having the processing power. So at least you can separate that problem away. Yes, you still have the problem of providing the, having a cluster, say, that provides you with the necessary number of, 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 of CPUs and, 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 and processing power. I think that's a heavy cost that you need to consider, right? Which is that if you want to do it, it's a function of the, the population you have between or behind that, that device or that cluster, definitely. But in some sense, it's, 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 you have to also remember that you are removing some functionality from the net, so that network becomes simpler. So in the total scheme, of the total, in the global, global uh, scheme of things, you're just kind of moving things around. It's not necessarily saying that you're adding more resources global. You're just adding more computational resources to that element, that cluster. But the network elsewhere gets simpler, at least. Well, you, yeah, but you've replaced, uh, you've replaced sort of you know, inexpensive high-performance ACs sure. with expensive sure. low-performance CPUs. And sure. It gives you flexibility, but there's a cost. Sure. Yeah. So the modularization example that you gave, right, separation of edge from the fabric and, and how policies can be implemented independent of what's happening in the fabric. But what if your policy is driven by the state of the fabric, what's happening? For example, let's say... So would be that, what would be that sort of a policy? Sorry? What would be an example of that sort of uh, policy? Let's say you want to do some sort of traffic management rate control at the edge based on how congested one, one particular node sure. is in the fabric. So if, if you actually want to kind of really optimize in terms of the... That's an optimization. Then you have to expose some hints that then you can't have the sort of a total decoupling. Exactly. Examples I had in my mind was that, that 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 you provide a full bisectional bandwidth and that that's all you do. But even in that case, actually, what you would do is that the higher levels probably layers probably would provide some QoS classification bits for the lower level levels of the, the, the for the fabric, so the fabric is able to do the queuing properly. So so again, the picture I had was kind of a, kind of an ideal. So for instance, QoS. Is something you just can't avoid. You have to expose enough information for the lower levels. Can I respond to that? Mm -hmm. I think the way I, I think about it is the public can have a different level of service that exposes to the edge, mm -hmm. and then edge can provide policies that are for this traffic, I, I, level, I need this level of SLAs through your fabric. Sure. And then fabric can do automatic rerouting in between sure, 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 to sure, match sure, the SLA sure, or sure, say, sure. I can't read here. The worst case, unfortunately, is that, that, that you might have, uh, you can't aggregate these policies, or these, 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 you can't have few aggregates of QoS policies. Some, some, some very exotic use case, and you may end up, might end up actually a huge number of those, uh, those, those, those categories of, of traffic you have. In your fabric, you know, the fabric is good as a dumb fabric, you yeah. do it as a fully traffic engineered fabric. Yeah. It's, it's basically full bisectional band, you have some factory kind of topology there, <coughs> and, and QoS bits are basically the only ones that you provide as, an, as, as extra things. <coughs> So I think all of this can be easily mapped to the data center context, mm -hmm. but have you gone through the exercise of mapping it to all different types of micro calendars and going back to make no, sure no, 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 I, I, I definitely, I, I definitely can't claim that. Right? I definitely can't claim that. So, so we have, uh, actually the, the students at, at Berkeley, they have done some work of, of uh, trying to map this sort of a hierarchy over, over larger topologies. But even they, they, ha they haven't considered like all the details, all the old kinds of, say, residential networks, campus networks. It was more on the, on the van side, basically, when it came to the considerations they had. Um, just a point to add to it, the, what, what the kind of thing I get back is, it's not only for data center. When two ends are controlled by same organization, then a lot of these things would go in place. For example, internet to a data center won't work. Data center, data center, backbone, backbone, and you control them for the ends, then those things would work. Yeah, but then the assumptions like you have a factory kind of connectivity, or you have very nicely traffic engineered stuff, all those assumptions don't work then, right? Now, if you could elevate, remove some of the intelligence from the network into a, into a different mechanism, the higher layers, which can control the flow of traffic across the path, then as long as the both paths are both ends, right. are managed by the same organization, then you can do a lot of right, exactly. So, so you got you got to have, have a high level traffic management almost. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is very interesting though. 
what I see is obviously just nothing more than a switch getting into the server. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, we, then we came the protocols like VXLAN, NVGRE, mm -hmm. and then Isira came with STD mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. And now there are talks about moving this protocol back into the NIC, mm -hmm. right? So what are your thoughts about it? Like, you know, it looks like it goes to a cycle. Right? So I might actually have a very strong opinion about that. You shouldn't fix these protocols actually within the NIC. You should just provide the primitives within the NIC that accelerate the encapsulation. And you can actually do that. Uh, I think even the modern, modern NICs today, they basically, they don't, the high-end NICs, at least, they have mechanisms that allow you to find offsets, basically. They, they don't understand protocols, really. You just have, like, like library of primitives, almost, you can even use. And I think that's the way to do it. Because then you don't, again, get bound to the hardware and the development cycles you have within the hardware. The control remains still complete with the software. If not, it became a same failure, actually. Right. right. So you mentioned that <coughs> Network programmers have to become distributed systems programmers. So I was wondering, as a programmer, what are those constructs or primitives that you think are most important for networking people to learn to move into this distributed systems world? I, I would say it's just the, all the basics, basically, the database things and, 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 and consistency related stuff and all that kind of usual classic distributed systems literature, basically. It's, it's, I don't think, I think it's more about the mindset actually, in some sense. Um, so for instance, the people I work with, none of them is a kind of a classic network engineer. They, ha they all have a background operating systems actually. And it's kind of interesting for those folks, it's easier to kind of move into this, this, this domain of SDN than for the most of the networking folks. Because networking folks have always the package, whereas the operating system folks, kind of classic system folks, while they perhaps don't know all the details of distributed databases and all that sort of techniques, at least they don't have that package. They have more of the correct mindset uh, on, on, when it comes to the overall system development. But unfortunately, I can't give you like a list of my top 10 uh, things to learn. So, uh, first of all, two more questions. So, are you working for something like what I would call SDN 2.0? where you can implement all these nice features mm -hmm. that do, you know, to solve the problems that you described in the beginning, mm -hmm. like reliability mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Or is that still, you know, you don't really need SDN 2.0, you can do, let's say, reliability and duplication of the controller using more or less standard distributed algorithms in SDN 1.0. So the funny thing is that, that, that we never think that we're actually building SDN networks. We are just building systems. And we are always solving all, all those problems I mentioned. But I, I can't go obviously go into all the details of that work. But it's not like we don't think this is a term of an S under the umbrella of SDN. We are just building software systems that solve all these problems. And the fact that we call it SDN is actually almost more for the external communication. I don't know if that was kind of a response to your but uh, let's say, you know, the problem of reliability of the mm -hmm. controller, right? Mm -hmm. So the standard way is mm -hmm. to say, to have a replica, sure. have sure. some distributed product, sure. that everything is the sure. same, sure. blah, blah, blah. Sure. Blah, blah, blah. And we do all that. All right. Things. So you right. don't really need to redesign whatever the protocol is already there for, sure. for what is called as the end. Sure, sure, sure. 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 I mean, in some sense, we are building everything from scratch. Uh, we control the V-switch, we control the cluster, so it's just software for us. We don't have to be bound by any of the, 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 the open flow or any of the SDN kind of assumptions. It's a software for us. So, in addition to being a protocol, open flow is sort of an abstraction for switch functionality. But it seems that you've argued that in the core, MPLS gives us a good enough abstraction. And at the edge, we don't need a protocol, we just need an API. Sure. So, my question is what's the correct switch abstraction? for both the edge and the core, and what's the API to that? So when it, comes to the, when it comes to the pure fabric, I actually think that you can do pretty nicely with the existing tools, IGD protocols. And, and, and you really probably need to have a very good reason to go beyond that, because all these protocols are fine-tuned, and, and like, they do exactly what they are expected to do, and, and, and they are stable, and they have been debugged pretty nicely over the past 20 years. Uh, but when it comes to the switch interface of the edge, then it gets more and more interesting. And, and there's kind of an extreme, uh, two extreme bandpoints, I suppose, here. 
Uh, some argue that it should be almost like x86 with download code. You download a VM, and then that VM is the interface almost. And then the other extreme is that you just have an open flow and you improve the open flow protocol enough to be flexible enough to, to allow you to do the failure domain, the failure handling properly, to allow you to do all the, all the operations you might need uh, to implement the server virtualization. And, and I would actually like to comment where, I wouldn't like to comment where we are within the spectrum, but, but, but I think those are the endpoints in, in the spectrum. And it's kind of a delicate balance in the sense that, that x86 is kind of easy to say, but in the end, even if you download x86 code there, you probably still have some sort of protocol to talk with that appliance. But that protocol probably is very application specific. It's, 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 it doesn't have to be like open flow. It could be like related more to the problem you're solving. So it just seems, almost, it seems less of a protocol and more of an API. It's, it's, it's a protocol still. I mean, you're, you're, it might be you know, kind of a like, I don't know, perhaps it's not a protocol in the, in the open flow sense. Perhaps a more kind of a like, RPC kind of thing, what do you have? Well, but but, but, it, but it's, it's definitely more application specific to take that route. Any other questions? Okay, well let's thank our speaker again.